So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, intermittent fasting. But before I get to that, I thought um, I, I love Dr. Davis's message about undoctored. And uh, unfortunately, my journey was much like his. I went through medical school and then residency at UCLA. And then I went and did probably uh, any disease and did it for, for a lot of years, like 10 years or so, and then realized that it really wasn't helping a lot of people, like the conventional medications. So, so I deal with uh, kidney disease, the biggest, the biggest cause of that is type 2 diabetes. And so we would spend so much money on dialysis and drugs and drugs and drugs. And it became obvious that I'm just sort of holding their hand until they get their heart attack, until they get dialysis, until they go blind, until we chop their feet off. And it's really sad to understand that the profession that you've chosen is actually not really helping people. And at the same time, we actually understand how to help people because these are all nutritional diseases. If people would lose weight, the diabetes would go away. If you don't get diabetes, Diabetes, type 2 diabetes, then you don't get diabetic kidney disease. Well, that's pretty obvious, but there's no money in it. So nobody was promoting this stuff. And it's sad because you're in the business to help people. And being a doctor, unfortunately, you get trained in this system where you really just get taught what drugs to give and what procedures to do and what surgery to give. So we went from the person that you went to to keep you healthy to the person who tells you what drug to give, even if that's not the cause. And it's sort of a sad state of affairs, and that's what, you know, that's what led me to start talking and blogging and writing books and so on about um, these sort of things, and why we use things like intermittent fasting, which nobody makes money on. And it sort of reminds me of a conversation I had with a friend of mine. So we were in our 20s. And this guy is like the smartest guy I know. He worked at Google, and then you know, he quit after two years and retired at 40, right? So really, really, really smart guy. And he says to me one time, and I said, hmm, you know how when you're kids, you think that adults, you know, they have their shit together, right? And then you grow up, and you realize nobody has their shit together. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's true. And it's the same thing with being a doctor. Like, you think that your doctor knows what the hell is going on, and then, as a doctor, you realize they have no bloody idea what they're doing out here. And that's the whole problem. And that's why you almost have to take you know, matters into your own hands. You have to take your health into your own hands. Because you're not going to hear it from the media. You're not going to hear it from the doctors. And sometimes you've got you to gotta do that. Because uh, just, just like Dr. Davis, I get, I get emails from people. They say, oh, thanks for writing the book. I listened to you, I you know, lost 30 pounds, I got myself off of insulin, my A1C is now normal, so therefore by definition, you're not diabetic. And I think, okay, that's great. And then I always think to myself, which I don't say to them, I always think to myself, why did you have to do that despite your doctor? Not because of your doctor, but despite your doctor. And that's a very, very, very sad you know, statement on the affair of things. I had a patient once who I, I saw in the IDM clinic. They were doing great. They lost weight. They, they were on insulin for 20 years, and I got them off in like four months. It was ridiculous. And their A1C was normal. So again, non-diabetic. And she was like, oh, I'm so happy. She went to her endocrinologist, who's a diabetes specialist. And he says, oh, good job. And then he t she told him he was fasting, and he screamed at her. Right? It's like, oh, my god. like. Any fool can see that this lady was so much healthier, and yet you go to your specialist, and they tell you, no, you should stop what you're doing, which is making you healthier, and everybody can see that, and go back to your diet that's going to make you sick and diabetic, which is going to lead to your amputation and your kidney disease. It's like, you know, sometimes medicine is just such a, such a logic-free zone. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about is, Another of these things that has been used, it, it's an intervention, uh, intermittent fasting, that has been used for thousands of years. And recently, it's gotten more popular. But when I started to use it about five years ago, it was considered quackery, right? So 
it was really thought to be uh, so dangerous that you know the people had to warn them against listening to me because obviously we know that you know you have to put muffins in your mouth every three hours to survive. <laughs> so that's the real problem of things. So this is what we're going to talk about. Sorry, this is the. Oh, sorry, this is not. Okay, so. I'm going to talk about intermittent fasting and kind of a little bit of how we got here. So it's about obesity, uh, and this is sort of where things came from, right? And you, you all know this. So in 1977, when they came out with the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, I don't think they were trying to kill people, but they were trying to do the best that <laughs> they could. But the problem is that they, uh, you know, they said, oh, you should eat lots of carbs, which is OK if you're an Okinawan eating like 90% sweet potato. But if you're eating all refined grains, then maybe it's not the best thing. And you should decrease your fat. And this is the real problem. This is the original food pyramid from the 1980s. And you can see that bread, pasta, and rice are like the, the base of that food pyramid. So every single day, you're supposed to eat like six or seven slices of bread. And we, this is 1980, and we all thought, hey, this is fantastic. So we all did it, because we're, we're trying to be healthy, and the government was telling us that this is what we should do. Nobody really thinks that white bread is all that slimming, so that's the problem. But that wasn't their point. The point was actually to try and combat heart disease, which, of course, was probably the exact wrong thing to do. But that's what we thought at the time. So everybody likes to blame the people. That is, oh, yeah, we gave them great advice, but they didn't listen. But really, they did listen. So if you look at consumption of butter, you know, way down eggs, animal protein, and we ate grains and sugar. Sugar was actually not supposed to, they didn't recommend it, but they, in, in the sort of hysteria of anti-fat, they're like, yeah, sugar is not so bad. So jelly beans and stuff, were, you know, they're fat free, right? So it's 100% fat free. <laughs> so this is the whole problem. And, you know, we always try to blame people. We say, well, you know, the obesity crisis is because people didn't listen to us. It's like, they did listen to us. The advice was not good, but people can't admit that, and that's the problem. So sugar was a particular problem because you can see that the, um, yeah. you can see that the, when the dietary guidelines came up, it's sort of like sugar was not so bad for you, so they, they, they increased their consumption of sugar. And so you can also see that grains increased their consumption as well. So it had been dropping until the 1970s and then really started to take off. And if you, ever, if you, if you live through that period of the 1980s, 1990s, when there's this real hysteria about fat, you understand, you know, big plates of pasta. Oh, great, that's fantastic, right? And they, we, we, I learned that in school. Oh, yeah, you should cut your fat cut out the butter, cut out the cream sauce, but have a big plate of pasta. So this was something that we were taught. But the other thing that we don't often talk about is that we're also eating a lot more frequently. And I think it was sort of inadvertent because what happens is if you eat a lot of refined grains, and a lot of people understand, you eat a couple of slices of bread, well, a couple hours later, you're actually really, really hungry. So then you want to go eat a muffin at 10.30. So we went from eating three times a day. So if you look at 1977, uh, you can see that this is the NHANES survey. So it's a big, large nutritional survey in America. In 1977, you can see most people are eating three meals a day. So again, if you live through the 1980s, if you grew up, you'd eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Nobody was eating snacks. Nobody was eating bedtime snacks. Nobody was chasing their kids around between the halves of soccer, giving them juice and cookies. That was what we did. If, if you were hungry after school, um, you'd ask your mom for a snack. You'd say, no, you're going to ruin your dinner. And that was that. If you're hungry after dinner, you said, she said, you should eat more at dinner. And that was it, right? There was no snacks, and that was the whole point. So you went from eating three times a day to eating um, six times a day, right? So if you look at my son's schedule, and I don't have that much control over it, is because it's breakfast, and at school you get a snack, and then at lunch, and then after school you go to the program, you get a snack, and you have dinner, and then you know between soccer somebody gives them a snack six times a day. And it's like that's before you know it, and we teach these kids, we ingrain this, we indoctrinate these kids into thinking that you must eat all the time, so it doesn't feel so wrong because everybody's doing it. And my teacher told me, and you think they have their shit together, right? So it's like, yeah, that must be correct. So then you go to a modern eating pattern, 
And this is uh, data from a couple years ago. So they gave people a smartphone app, and then they said, you know, check every time you eat. And the, uh, the, the dot is when they eat. And if you look at uh, where it is, you can see that people start eating in the morning, and they really just don't stop <laughs> until like 11 p.m. And this is the whole pro uh, problem of the modern eating pattern, is that we're eating very, very often. So you can see that where in 1977, everybody's eating three times a day, the lowest 10% of people are eating three times a day. The highest 10% of people are eating 11 times a day. And that's not because people didn't listen to us, it's because we tell them, you should eat six times a day, you should eat small, frequent meals all the time. But we never did that before. No society in human history has ever done that before because we have work to do. <laughs> We're not like, oh yeah, you know, going out in the field and it's like, yeah, I could really use a little cookie, right? Um, <laughs> there's no reason to do that because it's very, very difficult. But that's what it is now. Because so we make these convenience foods which are highly processed and usually with a lot of grains and sugars so that we can eat this frequently. And then we tell them they should. And we're eating later, so most of the Calories are consumed before noon, and you can see that um, you know, we're eating all the time as well. So the median uh, daily eating duration is 14 hours and 45 minutes. That's the average, right? That, that's the median, I should say, of everybody. So if you started eating at 8 a.m., you wouldn't stop until 10.45 p.m. That's the 50th percentile, right? A lot of people are eating more than that. They're starting at 7 a.m. and not stopping until 11 p.m. So the only time we're not eating is when we're sleeping. And that's one of the big problems because you know that every time you eat, your insulin is going to go up, assuming you're eating a mixed meal. And the insulin is actually uh, a hormone that tells your body to store food energy, right? I mean, the whole problem of obesity is not really all that difficult. If insulin goes up, your body is supposed to store that food energy. When you don't eat, when you fast, then your body is supposed to take that food energy back out and burn it. And that's the reason that you don't die in your sleep every single night. It's because you store it and then use it, right? And this is the problem. If you eat, insulin goes up, you store it. If insulin goes down, you burn it. But you can only do one or the other. If you spend all your time eating, then you're going to spend all your time putting food in. It's like a one-way valve. The food is going in, it never comes back out. So what's going to happen? Over time, you're going to gain weight. So that's not really so difficult. In fact, the, the English language itself provides the clue because it says you should eat breakfast, break fast. That's the meal that breaks your fast, so you have to fast. Healthy living is balance, right? So you have to balance the eating, which is the fed state, and you know, digestion or the fasted state. If you spend, eat three meals a day over 12 hours, you have 12 hours of feeding, 12 hours of fasting. Good. 12 hours a day, you're putting food in. 12 hours a day, you're taking food out. Now you're putting food in sort of 13, 15, 16 hours of the day and not taking it out because even after a meal, it takes a few hours before your insulin goes back down. So, uh, you know, and on the other side, of course, as soon as you eat, your insulin goes up right away. So it's a, there's a bit of an imbalance. So you're spending not just 14, 15 hours with your insulin high because it takes three or four hours for your insulin to come back down to get into the fasted state. You're really talking 17, 18, 19 hours in the fed state. And now instead of 12 and 12, you're talking about sort of 18 and 6 or something like that. So you're eating all the time. You're putting food energy in all the time. And what was the problem? The problem was that now we have this big obesity crisis. But there's two main issues. Other than the carbohydrates that, and the sugar that we were uh, told to eat, it's also the frequency. We're eating just too frequently. So the whole problem of weight loss is very uh, <laughs> clear. So the biggest loser is a, in a, a show where people compete to lose weight, and they never do a reunion show um, because they all gain their weight back, and this is the problem. Uh, everybody knows it, so anybody who's tried to lose weight knows that it's really, really hard to get that off, and this sort of calorie restriction diet, which has cut a few calories off of each meal, 500 calories a day, but eat six times a day, 
That sort of advice is the sort of standard advice. So if you look at the Biggest Loser diet, for example, you reduce your calories, you increase your exercise, um, and it, it ranks really well in these sort of rankings of diets. Number three for weight loss. Ketogenic diets, on the other hand, were dead last. So that's what people think. This is what the, the sort of nutritional authorities think about weight loss. This is what you should do. And we pretend we're living in this uh, era of evidence-based medicine. That is, okay, if you think it works, well, show me the study to show that it works. Well, we've done those studies. So this is the Today study, for example, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is actually the, probably the most prestigious medical journal in the world. And what they did is they took this approach, which is calorie uh, deficit approach, uh, which is decreasing energy intake, you know, cutting out the fat, cutting out the sugar. The sugar is probably a good thing. And then they compared sort of lifestyle. Everybody got metformin, which is a diabetic drug, because these were type 2 diabetics. Everybody got metformin, and then you either got rosiglitazone, which actually caused a bit of weight gain on the right, on the, on the red. But then you also have this, the, the, the lifestyle versus no lifestyle treatment. So cutting your calories, increasing your energy, because this is what they're trying to do, you can see that this uh, green line, they started at a body mass index of 34, and after um, you know, five years of hard work, you ended with a body mass index of 34. So it didn't really work at all. You only got back to baseline through a lot of hard work at the fifth year. Uh, if before that, you're actually gaining weight. So this is, this is the approach. It doesn't work. And this is the diabetes prevention program, which is the same thing. So if you look at lifestyle, which is the, the, the circle, you can see that in the first six months, you do really great. You lose a lot of weight, six, seven kilograms, 15 pounds. But by the end of that four or five years, again, your weight loss is no different than if you did nothing at all. So if you got no dietary advice, you didn't cut your calories, it didn't make any difference, right? So there's the evidence. So we have this intervention, and cutting calories, a little few calories every day, it doesn't really work. This is the Women's Health Initiative, which is a huge randomized controlled trial, almost 50,000 women. Again, here it is. These women are cutting almost 360 calories every single day. And they're doing it year after year, and they increase their exercise. So this is metabolic equivalence. It went from 10 to 11.1, so about a 10% increase in their physical activity. They're moving more, they're walking more, and all that. Well, what happened? Well, here's the difference. Overall, at the end of seven, eight, nine years, there's barely any difference at all. If you measure waist circumference and so on, you might think, oh, well, they're actually gaining more muscle. It turns out they're not. There's actually no difference at all. So here we have three randomized controlled trials of this calorie-restricted diet, and it doesn't work. We've proved it. And yet, if you go to talk to your doctor, he'll say, well, what you need to do is just cut your calories and exercise more calories in, calories out. There you go. It's like, but it's not true. You know it doesn't work. We've proved it doesn't work. And the hardest part to, for people to understand is this is when people stay on their diet, because this is, this is a study. So you measure the people who stay on their diet. These people are not failing because they fail to follow the diet. They're failing because the diet doesn't work. And this is what's really important, because we tend to ascribe a lot of blame onto the victims. We play this game called blame the victim, which is that is, we gave you this advice to lose weight. You didn't lose weight because you didn't follow the advice. So we're blaming them, but yet they're the ones who are suffering. They're the ones who are getting sick. They're the ones taking the diabetes. And that's like the most unfair thing we do because the evidence shows that this approach actually just doesn't work. And we know this doesn't work. Really, if you look at the UK general practice database, what you can do is look at people who have tried to lose weight using this sort of advice. And the probability of achieving a normal weight if you're morbidly obese is 0.1%. In other words, this diet that we recommend as doctors is, has a 99.9% .9 failure rate. But when you fail, we're going to blame you 100% of the time. <laughs> like, that's, that's the reality of modern medicine. 
Everybody knows this. Everybody says this. So you take these sort of Bible of diabetes, you say Jocelyn's diabetes, it says, well, you know, restriction of calories is the cornerstone. Yet, none of these approaches has any proven merit. So as in, we know it doesn't work, but we're going to recommend it, right? Handbook of obesity, dietary therapy, reduction of energy. Results of such diets are known to be poor and not long lasting. So we know it doesn't work, but we're going to recommend it anyway. And you know, that's so illogical, like seriously, seriously bad. So we actually know why it doesn't work, because we've studied this over 100 years. We know why this sort of cut 500 calories a day, every single day, just doesn't work, because of slowing metabolism. That is, there's two main problems. One is the slowing metabolism. If you cut somebody's calories down, their daily energy expenditure is also going to go down. So this study from 1917, so as in 100 years ago we knew this, if you cut their calorie uh, uh, intake by about 30%, what you see is a 30% reduction in basal metabolism. You see it in Ansel Keys' uh, Biology of Human Starvation, which was actually not a starvation study. It was a 1,500 calorie a day diet, so not very different than anything that we recommend now. So we think, well, people take, say, 2,000 calories, you should cut it to 1,500. That's what this study is. So when you cut their calories by about 40%, guess what? Their metabolic rate drops by about 40%. Their heart volume shrank by 20%. The heart rate slowed. The body temperature goes down. Because it's, it takes a lot of energy to, to, burn, uh, to burn those calories to generate body heat. So if your, your body doesn't want to burn so much because it's not getting in so much. And we've proven this in, in, the, in the lab too. So Rudy Leibel, he did this fantastic experiment where he took people and he, um, he gave them, uh, their, at their initial weight, he made them gain weight by force feeding them. They had a, you know, this uh, milkshake that they had to take. So they gained 10% weight, then they went to back to their initial weight, then they went to 10% weight loss. And at, at all points, they measured their basal metabolic rate. So you see that at 10% body weight gain, your body actually ramps up its metabolism. It's burning about 500 calories per day more. It's trying to burn it off, right? As you go back to your initial weight, it goes back to its baseline. And as you lose weight, you're burning about 300 calories a day less. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to cut. You know, this is the big fallacy of these calories in, calories out people. Because if you simply cut your calories by eating less, your body will respond by burning less. And then you're going to plateau, and then you're going to regain that weight, and then somebody, you're going to face that sort of massive wall of condensation of, oh, you let yourself go. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> like, come on, we've already proven that. And you hope that this, this sort of thing goes away after a while, but it never does. So if you overfeed people, the TE, which is total energy expenditure, goes up. If you underfeed people, the total expenditure goes down, and it persists over time. It persists over a year. So getting back to the biggest loser, this is really what happens here, is that if you measure these contestants um, at, say, when, you know, six weeks and 30 weeks, what you find is that they've lost a lot of weight. So it's great. So they've lost, they went from 329 pounds to 202 pounds. Body fat went from 49% to 28% over six weeks. So you see the results on the TV. They, they look fantastic. So that's great. But what happened to their metabolism? And this is what happens. You see, before they started, they were the dark circle. After they, at 30 weeks, so six months roughly, they, that's the open circle. And what you can see is that everybody's basal metabolism, the amount of calories they're burning every day, and this is not exercise, this is to keep your brain working, to keep your liver working, to keep your lungs working, is going way down. So this poor guy over here, for example, starts off at 3,500 calories, and he went all the way down to here, which is like 1,800 calories a day. So almost 1,700 calories per day, he's burning less than he did before. And you wonder why his calorie-restricted diet is stopping working, because your metabolic rate's going way, way, way down. So this is what you see in The Biggest Loser. So if you look at the, um, the, the shaded area, that's, the, uh, that's your basal metabolism. That's not including exercise. 
the white bar on top is the exercise. So what you do is, in the show of course, is they try and make up for it with insane amounts of exercise. So you can boost that up, but then as you go, you, your, your basal metabolic rate is still going down. And this is the problem, right? So they get off the show, they're not doing eight hours a day of whatever it is they're doing, and that white bar is, goes back to sort of normal, and then that's it. They're not burning the calories, so even after they reduce their calories, their weight goes back up. So you see this when, when you uh, look at the biggest loser, except for this guy who, who, who um, had the stomach surgery. Their basal metabolic, their, their weight goes all back up. You know, some people 50 pounds more than they did at the beginning. And then, but it's because their basal metabolic rate is slowing so much. And this is the whole problem, is that we assume that energy out stays stable, right? So it's a two compartment problem, that's the whole thing. So if you have a, a factory, for example, a, you know, energy producing coal burning factory, you have energy in, which is the coal, and then when it goes in, your body actually has two ways to use it. You can either burn it for energy, or you can store it as fat, right? So the energy comes in, say the coal comes in, you can either burn it or you can store it. When you eat calories, you have the same option. You can burn it or you can store it as body fat, right? So if you reduce the amount of energy in, so say you reduce the amount of coal that comes in, what we hope is that you keep burning the same amount of energy and then the fat stores will come down, right? That would be fantastic. So if you're the manager of a coal burning factory, for example, uh, you know, you get a little less coal, you still burn the same and then you just decrease the amount of stores. Well, that would be good, except that's not what happens. What actually happens is that the fat stores stay the same, your energy goes down, your energy out goes da uh, down, and that's the problem. So the whole fallacy of calories in, calories out is that that stays stable, but it doesn't. We've known that for 100 years. We have all the studies to prove that it doesn't work. And the problem is not what you're putting in. The problem is this control right here. This is the main problem, not this. So everybody points to this, but you actually have to control this. Because if this comes in and it goes out as energy, it's okay. But if this comes in and goes over to fat stores, then you're not okay. So you're really talking about the hormonal control of energy partitioning. And that's the whole problem. How do you control it? How do you control those uh, hormones? The second big problem is hunger. So what we see is that if you lose weight, then you get more hungry. So this is, again, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They took people, they lost weight, and then they measured something called ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, and that's here. So black is baseline, and then at week 10, week 62, what you find is that as you lose weight, so you lose weight, but the weight slowly comes back on, but at all points, again, you can see that the ghrelin level is higher. In other words, you stay hungry with weight loss. So you see this in terms of it will translate the ghrelin, which is the hormonal mediator, is going to translate into higher levels of hunger. So this is the big problem. So you know that if you lose weight and you don't control those sort of uh, things, then you're going to not be able to control the hunger and you're going to eat. And again, this is not just a lack of willpower. This is real physiology here. It's like if we did that to any one of you, you would be hungrier and you would eat because that's the physiology, but we don't do that, right? We, we blame people and we say, oh, you, you know, you couldn't stop yourself from eating. It's like, yeah, because their ghrelin is higher. You never controlled the hormonal mediators. And that's the real issue of um, the body set weight, which is that the adaptation to weight loss is to reduce your energy expenditure and increase your hunger. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to move past this a little bit. So one of the problems is this, right? So you have to actually control insulin, which is going to be the hormonal mediator of what's going to, where this energy is going to go. If you don't control it, then you're going to lose. So if you cut 500 calories per day by cutting the fat off your meat, for example, that dietary fat has almost no insulin effect. It has 500 calories, but no insulin effect. Your insulin's just as high. So if insulin's high, you're going to direct all that energy towards your fat stores. And this is, uh, that's where you're going to lose. So how does fasting uh, help this problem? Well, 
If you look at the metabolic changes of fasting, what you see is that the um, basal metabolic rate is maintained. So this is four days of fasting. What you can see is that the top is the weight. The weight is steadily coming down, but REE is the resting energy equivalent. And what you see is that at the end of four days of not eating, your basal, basal metabolic rate is actually 10% higher than when you started. And the VO2, which is a measure of how much you know, energy you're burning, is the same. And it's because there are other hormonal changes. That is, as insulin goes down, other hormones go up. So insulin is coming down, but then your counter-regulatory hormones goes up, including something called noradrenaline or norepinephrine, as well as your sympathetic tone and growth hormone. Those are the counter-regulatory hormones, and they go up. And that's how you maintain your basal metabolic rate. After 22 days of alternate daily fasting, for example, what you see is that the RMR, which is your resting metabolic rate, goes from 66, 70, 63, sorry, to 6300, which is not significantly different. Um, this study uh, compared CR, which is calorie restriction, to, um, to alternate daily fasting. Again, you look at the adjusted resting metabolic rate, the box on the right, shows you that the caloric restriction reduces your energy output by 76 calories a day. The fasting group only went down by 29, which with a p-value is 0.4, which means that's not statistically significant. So again, this is one of the big problems of weight loss, long-term weight loss, is this metabolic rate. And because the fasting improves the hormonal changes about the energy partitioning, it's not, actually, um, it's not actually giving you the same problems because your body is not just ratcheting down its energy expenditure. What it's done is it's switched over its fuel sources from food to body fat because that's what body fat is for. It's for you to use when you have nothing to eat. It's not there for looks. It's for you to use. So use it. That's all you need to do. Don't do something silly like eat six times a day, cut your fat, and cut a few calories. The other problem is hunger. And this is, this is again, ghrelin. We're looking at fasting and ghrelin. So they took people. They fasted for 24 hours. And then they, they uh, measured their ghrelin at, at all time points. And this is one of the things I always hear. Ah, if you don't eat that muffin, you're going to be so hungry. You know, you're going to stuff your face afterwards. So what actually happens when you don't eat for 24 hours? So those, those things on top, that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you see that ghrelin does spike. So you do get hungry at that time. But what happens when you don't eat lunch? So say you skip lunch. This is the first one, L. Does ghrelin just keep going up and up and up? No. In fact, when you get to 4 o'clock, your ghrelin has gone back down to baseline, because this, this line is here is baseline. That is, you're about as hungry eating lunch as not eating lunch. And the same thing happens at dinner time. Your ghrelin goes up, yes, then you don't eat, and several hours, it just goes right back down to baseline. So the hunger doesn't build and build and build. It actually comes as a wave. If you ride out that wave, It'll just go back to baseline. And we've all done this, right? So you've been so busy, you worked right through lunch. I mean, you did this tons of times in medical school. You're too busy, you didn't eat dinner. Yeah, at 12 o'clock, you're hungry. At 1 o'clock, you're hungry. At 4 o'clock, it's as if nothing happened. It's as if you ate lunch. And you just kept working. And we know this happens because we've all done this before. And we know that it's just, yeah, you might eat a little bit more at dinner, but you're not like ravenously starving. And it's OK to not eat because what's happened is that your body has taken that food energy from your body fat. And that's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to do. The interesting part is when you go into the multiple day fast, what you see is that over you know, four or five days, the ghrelin goes up and down. But over the ensuing days, it actually goes lower and lower and lower. And we see this with the, with the day, people who are doing sort of four or five days of fasting at a time, that the hunger actually starts to disappear. Because you're fueling your body through your body fat, so then you don't have that hunger anymore. And you're getting more efficient at using it. So therefore, it's a great strategy. Some people say, oh, well, women, it doesn't help. It turns out, if you look at ghrelin, women have a much bigger spike in ghrelin than men. And so if you look at food cravings and so on, women tend to feel it more. So they actually get more benefit. Because some people say, oh, women should never fast. It's like, why? They get more benefit 
uh, from that than anybody else. And the weight loss is the same. If you look at food cravings, for example, you can compare a low calorie diet to a very low calorie diet. So it's interesting because you can take any of these cravings, sweets or high fat or whatever, you put them on a 12, 1300 calorie a day diet. Those cravings don't do anything. So this is the measure of the cravings and this is how much they have cravings. The low calorie diet does nothing. But if you eat practically nothing at all, the cravings just disappear. Because the cravings are like an itch. So any parent knows that if your child is really itchy, the last thing you really want to do is scratch it because it's going to get more itchy. And cravings are the same. So by going into these intermittent fasting where you're really allowing nothing at all, that's going to make more benefit for your cravings than the other. And controlling hunger is the big issue. It's not about controlling calories. I mean, that's like grade school stuff, right? You have to control the metabolic rate, and you have to control your hunger signaling. That's what's important. And what's really interesting is that if you go to very low calorie diets, um, as you start to refeed, what you can see is that the, the, uh, the cravings don't go back. So they start up uh, out here, but even after six weeks of refeeding, the cravings have gone away. So you're sort of reprogramming your body for that. So this is the, uh, again, the changes. So when you compare CR, which is calorie restriction, to alternate daily fasting, if you look at the box, what you can see is that the ghrelin is significantly different. If you look at calorie restriction, this one, the ghrelin goes up by 71. So you're more hungry after doing this calorie restriction. The alternate daily fasting is only up by, uh, I think it's 16, but the p-value is 0.5, which means it's not significantly different. Again, the calorie restriction, daily calorie restriction, causing more hunger, the alternate daily fasting causing less hunger. And that's a huge, huge, huge part. So if you look at long-term weight loss, what you see is that chronic calorie restriction, cutting the fat, cutting your calories, eating six times a day, so you're keeping your insulin high but dropping your calories, what you get is increase in hunger and a decrease in metabolism. And this is what happens, your weight plateaus, your weight starts to regain, and you're like, oh, don't even look at me, right? As you, as, as you face that sort of, you know, all that judgmental people who are like, oh, yeah, you shouldn't have regained that weight. It wasn't their fault, because we know that. This is all physiology. As opposed to fasting, where your hunger decreases, your metabolic rate stays stable or goes up, and you're like, yeah, let's go. So that's the whole problem. Why don't we actually do this for people, right? It's because there's so many myths with intermittent fasting. People say, well, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. You're going to burn muscle, right? That's one of the more common things I hear. If you don't eat, you're going to burn muscle. And it's actually not true. If you look at studies, for example, this study, where they compared fasting, so 70 days of alternate daily fasting, you can see that the fat mass has gone down from 43.5 to 38.1. And the fat-free mass, or your lean mass, went from 51.9, sorry, 51.4 to 51.9. So in fact, your lean muscle is being maintained. Because again, remember, what you're doing is you're dropping insulin and raising growth hormones so that when you eat, you're going to rebuild that protein. So you're maintaining that lean mass. If you look at this uh, study, again, uh, from 2016, if you compare the uh, the two groups, calorie restriction versus alternate daily fasting, what you see is that the truncal fat mass is much better with the alternate daily fasting, so 1.8% versus 0.3%. And this is the really dangerous stuff, right? The fat that's carried around your belly. So that is like six times better. But if you look at uh, lean mass, it's, it's, so calorie restriction is up by 0.5% because you've lost some fat, but alternate daily fasting is up by 2.2%. In other words, it's like four times better at maintaining lean mass. So this whole idea, oh, you're going to burn muscle, is just a myth. And if you think about it, again, do you think that our body is designed so stupidly that we store body, food energy as body fat, and when we need it, we're going to burn protein? It's like, yeah, that's a good idea. Like, you got to think that Mother Nature is so stupid. We think we're so smart, and humans are so smart, and Mother Nature is so stupid. You know, we've been here for millions of years. You, you store body fat so that you can use it when there's nothing to eat. You're not going to burn your protein. It's like, 
you know, storing all this firewood, and then the minute you need something for your wood-burning stove, you chop up your sofa and throw it in the fire. <laughs> like, honestly, do you think that's the human body? Like, the human body is not that stupid. Uh, and the other thing that people say, oh, yeah, you can't do it, right? Yeah, it's a great idea, but nobody's going to do it, right? And it's like nobody, like all the Buddhists that don't do it, like all the Muslims who don't do it, all the Catholics who don't do it, all the Jews who don't do it. I mean, literally, billions of people around the world follow this because of religion, because of spirituality, for whatever reason they do it. Billions of people have been doing this for thousands of years, like at least since the time of like zero or, or you know, <laughs> Jesus, when he said, oh yeah, you should fast, like during Lent and so on. Like, it's thousands of years we're talking of human history that people have done it. And, oh, since 1970, it was a really bad idea because modern man is so smart. And yet we get this obesity epidemic, this type 2 diabetes epidemic, and we still tell people, you should never fast ever. It's like, that's ridiculous. So it doesn't work is another refrain. It's like, well, if you don't eat, you'll probably lose weight. And I put this in because some people say, oh, women, it doesn't work in. And it's like, well, it does, because when you put them on fast, women lose weight at the same rate as men. It's, it's, it, if you don't eat, you're going to lose weight. And, and the thing about fasting is that we're, we're, we're talking about something, we're dealing with something completely different than diet, okay? So diet is something that tells you, should I eat this or should I eat this, right? Uh, fasting doesn't talk about that at all. Fasting is dealing with everything outside the period that you're eating. So it has nothing to do with diet. You could eat a high-fat diet or you could eat a vegetarian diet. That has nothing to do with fasting. Fasting is really dealing with a completely separate question of when you should eat. That is, you should eat within a certain time or whether you should or shouldn't eat. It's a completely different question. Therefore, it's much more powerful because um, you can add it to sort of any diet. And that's really a lot of the advantages. So it's flexible, for example. You could do it this week and not do it next week. You could, it's convenient because you don't, if you don't eat, you don't have to shop, you don't have to cook, you don't have to eat, and you don't have to clean up. And it's like, honestly, that's the reason I don't eat breakfast, because I wake up at 7, I want to be out by 7.15. So if I want to shower, I'm not going to eat. And it's, it's so much easier. And my son does this, and all the teenagers do this, because they wake up, so I wake up 20 minutes before I get out, my son wakes up two minutes before he gets out the door, right? <laughs> So it's convenient for people because you don't have to do it. And this is one of the things. We all have busy lives. So we all say, oh, you know, you should eat a home-cooked meal every single time. It's like, that's a great idea, but it takes a lot of time. This is not that. This is going to actually give you back time. So when I get busy, I tend to do more because I have work to do. It's free. So <laughs> this is a huge advantage. Like, if you deal with disadvantaged peoples, if you're dealing with uh, native peoples, people who just don't have the resources to buy pasture, you know, pasture, pasture fed, uh, you know, organic produce. It's like, that's great stuff, but it's expensive. Like, these people are not shopping at Whole Foods. They're, they, got, they got a budget. And this is going to give them back money. It's not just free. It actually gives you back money because you don't have to buy all this stuff. And it's simple. So again, you can take these diets, like uh, ketogenic diets, for example, and you can say, well, you know, they're great. But they're complicated. So I deal with the 65, 70-year-old Filipino lady who doesn't speak much English. And you know, she's been eating this way, her way, for 65, 70 years. It's very hard to change her, but it's a lot easier to say, well, these meals don't eat, and just treat it like a medical therapeutic intervention. You're going to let your body burn off the sugar, then you're not going to need your insulin. And they understand that, and the simpler it is, the easier it is. And that's the whole point. You can add this to any diet, because it's not about the diet. It's about a completely separate question. So whether it's meat or wheat or nuts, or you don't have time, you don't have money, you're traveling all the time, you don't cook, all of this stuff, you can still use the fasting. And one of the things that always appeals to the sort of doctors is that you have un it gives you sort of this unlimited power. Because the reason why people like it is because if you have a drug, for example, like insulin, 
um, you can prescribe, you can give it, and you know, certain drugs have a maximum dose. So you give metformin and there's a maximum dose. People like insulin because you can just keep ramping the dose. Well, fasting is the same. Like if you take a diet, like a vegetarian diet, and you don't do well, well, you can't get any more vegetarian to get better results, right? It, it doesn't work that way. Or if you're doing a ketogenic diet, it's like you can't get more ketogenic because if that didn't work for you, it didn't work for you. That's the bottom line. But with the fasting, it's almost inconceivable that you can, you can not lose weight because if you don't eat, you have to lose weight. So nobody um, doubts that. It's just the, the, the reason people tell you not to do it is because they say it's so unhealthy for you. But it's actually the opposite is true. And again, we get back to this idea that you know, what's so um, you know, disconcerting about the whole thing is that these sort of ideas are not new. They're actually the oldest ideas that ever came about. Like, I didn't make this stuff up. It came from Jesus Christ. It came from the prophet Muhammad. It came from Buddha, you know, the three most influential people in the history of the world. Like, they only probably agreed on that one thing. <laughs> um, so we've practiced this throughout humanity, throughout human history, and yet, as we get into the 21st century, we think that our old selves are so stupid that it's not going to help you. So you know, these, are, these are like the oldest ideas in the book, and, and, and they're so powerful, and, they're so, and there's so much physiology behind it. We've studied this for hundreds of years, and why can't we do it, right? And the answer always comes back to there's no money in it. There's no money in it. Like, that's it. And this is why these sort of things are so important to get these ideas out there, because the point is not to make money. I don't make money. If you fast and do well, I don't make any money. But I get paid in a different way, right? Same as Bill. We get paid in a different way, which is that we understand that we're actually able to help move the needle for human health, and we're allowing people to take control of their own health, because if you have obesity, if you have type 2 diabetes, you no longer have to say, oh, well, I have to go see my doctor to see what pill I need. I need to go see my doctor to see if he needs to stick a stent in me. No, we're giving you the power to take back your own health because you're not going to get it from anywhere else. Thank you. Um, that presentation. So we are going to start with some questions from the floor. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask, Dr. Fung? Uh, okay, there's one. Here. Thank you, Dr. Fung. That was wonderful. I wanted to clarify a little bit about the caloric load and some of the different fasting approaches you talked about. So let's say in a calorie restriction model, they would have someone eat 1,600 calories a day down from a 2,000 calorie a day diet. In an inter intermittent fasting type program, would you still have them eat the 2,000 calories a day in a six hour window each day? Or in the alternate daily fasting, are they eating 2,000 calories the day they eat and zero the calorie the day they don't eat? Or how does that work? Yeah, so that's a great question. Again, the fasting only prescribes the amount of time that you're not eating. So whether you eat all your calories in that time or you don't eat that many calories in that time is really talking about the diet. So in most times, I actually don't recommend people count calories. I don't think it's a useful thing to do because the body doesn't count calories. It's not a physiologic um, problem. What you want to do is eat until you're full. I mean, they did that in the 50s, and it worked out fine for them. But what you have to do is really cut out all of these refined foods. So a lot of the refined grains, specifically, or a lot of the sugar, specifically. So if you're eating things like meat and real food and vegetables and so on, you're going to get full at a certain point. Because again, we think our bodies are so stupid. But the truth is that we have multiple overlapping satiety mechanisms. That is to say, if you eat protein, 
your uh, a hormone called peptide YY goes up. If you eat fat, cholecystokinin goes up. If you eat a lot of fibrous foods, you activate stretch receptors in your stomach. So we have multiple overlapping um, mechanisms that tell us not to eat. And they're very powerful, because if you think back to a time where you went to the Chinese buffet and you ate a lot of food and so on, and you said, whoa, I can't eat anymore, like the sight of those pork chops might make you nauseated. But half an hour ago, you're gobbling them down, right? And that's because you've activated these satiety mechanisms. So you have to get back to that, but the, the, the sort of processed foods evade that. So if you're eating, you know, you've had that big buffet and then you can't eat any more steak. But if somebody says, well, hey, do you want this cookie? You're like, yeah, sure. Because it doesn't activate those same satiety mechanisms. So the point is not to count your calories because that's ultimately self-defeating. You could take Diet Coke, for example, zero calories, but it doesn't have zero insulin effect and it's gonna make you more hungry. So the point is that during that six hour period, you could take as many calories as you want. I don't recommend people, to, but stick to real food whole foods, and your body will tell you when to stop. If you decide that it's not working, then you simply extend it and say, okay, well, that didn't work, so I'll do a 24-hour fast and, and go from there. But counting calories in general is not something I recommend. So you might be getting the full amount of calories, but just in a concentrated period of time. But more likely, you're actually going to reduce the amount of calories because it's hard to put all those calories. So for example, if you're, if you're fasting, three, four days, you're not gonna be able to eat 15,000 calories in that one sitting afterwards. So most of the time, you're going to naturally restrict your calories uh, all day. You're gonna eat more. So if you eat, say, one meal a day, which is like a 24-hour fast, for example, chances are that meal you're gonna eat more than you normally do, but not like three times as much to compensate for the breakfast and lunch that you did, didn't do. But again, stick to the real foods, stick to the whole foods, and you're gonna do fine because your body actually has the same mechanism. That's why in the 50s and 60s, nobody counted calories and everybody was thin because it, this, is, this is sort of the natural state. You have to let people go. But if you try and circumvent all these mechanisms by eating a lot of processed foods, by eating constantly, then that's why you start to gain weight because you've circumvented the satiety. And that's why you eat bread and jam in the morning and then by 10.30, it's like, oh, I'm hungry. And then the dietician says, well, the bread and jam was great because it was so low fat. But then at 10.30, it's like, go get a low fat muffin. So that's the problem. You've, you've circumvented those satiety mechanisms and now you're hungry again. But if everybody knows, if you ate steak and eggs in the morning, oh, I think that, that thing just sits there, right? It just doesn't move. And then you're like 10.30, whoa, I'm not gonna go get that low fat muffin because it's like, whoa, that steak is still there. Um, because there, there are those natural satiety mechanisms. So don't count your calories, but you normally will, when you cut the time, it will naturally sort of come down anyway. I just wanna take a text question here real quick, um, which I have heard you talk about before. If someone has a history of eating disorders, is there a risk that participating in intermittent fasting could trigger those behaviors? Would you approach the process any differently? Yeah, so it's, it's definitely a question of context. So first, the studies don't show that it does. So we're talking about anorexia and bulimia. So anorexia was a big problem in the 1970s. People would actually die from anorexia, and that was a big problem. So the whole thing is that that's a, a, a it's not a, um, it's a psychiatric disorder of body image. That is, people think they're fat, but they're really skinny. And the whole thing is that it's, it's a matter of context. So if you're a 16 years old girl who's like 35 pounds sort of thing, then yeah, you shouldn't be fasting. But the risk, for example, of this 60 year old 300 pound man developing anorexia nervosa is virtually zero. So it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna fast this 16 year old stick thing girl, but this 300 pound diabetic man I am gonna fast, so it's a matter of context. So yeah, if there is a history of anorexia nervosa, then yeah, you have to be cautious and you might try instead just to adjust their diets and so on. Um, and I always say that fasting, it's, it's a weapon, right? It's a weapon in the fight against obesity. If you use it wrong, it's, it, it can hurt, like it can kill you. The, so those people in the 70s when Twiggy was really popular and stuff, like a lot of, a lot of girls died. It's like a serious problem, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it in the 60-year-old man because he's going to die of his heart disease or he's going to die of type 2 diabetes and dialysis. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Priscilla, please. So, excellent presentation. Could you speak to uh, the data on intermittent fasting on the brain? 
and cognitive function. Um, yeah, that's a really fascinating uh, topic, actually. And there's not a huge amount of data. But the, uh, it, it appears that intermittent fasting, or fasting in general, improves cognitive function, which is, uh, you know, a lot of people have the opposite. And this is one of the other big myths. So, you know, oh, I have to work, so I'm not going to be able to concentrate. Um, when you don't eat, it turns out that if you do studies of memory and so on, it's improved. So there are stories from you know, antiquity. So the, the Pythagoras, the famous Greek mathematician, for example, would require his students to fast before coming into, into class because it would improve their cognitive function. And that's, again, because you're allowing your, your uh, you know, instead of eating and all the blood sort of working on digestion, you, can, you have that available for cognitive function. And if you think about Thanksgiving, for example, if you say, oh, you had this big meal, it's like, do you feel like really, really sharp afterwards? It's like, oh, no, most people just want to sit down and watch some football because you're sort of sluggish. They call it food coma and stuff. So the cognitive function is actually increased. Uh, I always look back, I, had, I, found, I read this fascinating book called Unbroken, which is about prisoners of war in Japan. Um, and one of the passages, um, they, this, this man who is, who is literally starving says that he, he observes his, his um, you know, the other prisoners and, and he says one is like reading a book 100% from memory and another learned Norwegian within a week. And he says, this is the astonishing mental clarity of starvation. I'm like, whoa, like they knew about this. <laughs> Like, why didn't anybody tell us, right? So what's, what's fascinating is that in Silicon Valley, intermittent fasting is taken off like crazy. And it's not because these, you know, 20-something skinny computer geniuses need to lose weight. They don't. But it's a very, very competitive world. And if you can increase your cognitive function, it's the difference between Facebook and MySpace, right? It could mean millions of dollars. So they're fasting because they want an edge. And um, you know, even in, in sports, you see this as well. So we work with some elite athletes, uh, some of whom are like fighters, for example. And they're like, whoa, I can't believe it because I'm fasting and I can see everything, right? Because their senses are heightened. And why? It's because the sympathetic tone is increased, noradrenaline is increased. So this is not because of some you know, psychology. It's because of real physiology. They feel better, they feel sharper, and it's like, yeah, because think about it for a second. If you're a fighter, like an elite fighter, like multiple martial arts or, or whatever, uh, do you want to be the hungry wolf or do you want to be that lion that just ate, right? Because that lion that just ate is just lying there in the sun and the hungry wolf is sharp and so on. So the cognitive function has actually increased significantly. Can it do things like prevent Alzheimer's? That's a really interesting question. I don't have an answer, but my, my, my guess is yes. Because again, you activate this sort of process called autophagy, which is where you're clearing out some of the old proteins, including perhaps some of the protein that's clogging up the brain in the end. Um, you're increasing your mitochondrial health and all this stuff, which increases your bioenergetics of the mitochondria, those cells that provide energy. And you're, you're able to increase it. You see increased uh, mitochondrial biogenesis with fasting, for example, increased turnover, and so on. So it's a very powerful therapy that's been used for many, many years, not because uh, people thought it was unhealthy for you, but because people thought it was extremely healthy. We are running a little bit over. So I want to ask, do you guys want to stay and do Q&A, or do you want to go drink coffee? Yay. Um, OK, I'm going to go back to the text line real quick. Um, are there studies that show a de decreased prevalence of diabetes in the populations who have been fasting for religious and spiritual reasons for thousands of years? Uh, this is a good question, because they've studied Ramadan. And I was talking with um, Dr. Seafried about this. Ramadan turns out not to be very good. So Ramadan is the holy month of fasting. You're not allowed to eat from sunup to sundown. So the original idea, the Prophet Muhammad was a very great uh, proponent of fasting. You're supposed to fast twice a week and then Ramadan, and you're supposed to eat just a little bit to sustain you. Turns out what happens in real world sort of 2018 is that the people wake up at 4 a.m., gorge themselves, and then they fast. And then when the sun goes down, they're drinking tubs of Coca-Cola and gorging themselves again. 
And that's not really super healthy for you. So unfortunately, you, you don't have that data. Um, there is emerging data, so it was just published actually last week, I think, where they used intermittent fasting strategies, and what they found was that it could be just as effective as any of the other dietary therapies. We've published some cases where people an, implement these intermittent fasting strategies and are able to get, get off of insulin and so on, because again, it's not difficult to understand. You don't eat, your blood sugars come down. If blood sugars come down, don't take your medications. And pretty soon, if you do that consistently, you lose weight. As you lose weight, the diabetes gets better. So it's, it's a, um, it's, it, it works, obviously, and I don't think there's much doubt. Perfect. We'll take a question from the floor. Uh, sure. Thank you uh, for the message. I just wanted to share, it's more of a comment than a question. I, we have been doing the uh, intermittent fasting program in our prevention program in conjunction with the, with the CrossFit box. Uh, happy to report that uh, over the last year that we've been doing, doing this, our patients have lost 1.25 tons of weight of fat <laughs> and gained 478 pounds of muscle or lean mass during that time. So we've been measuring. <laughs> Um, there's a question from the text line. What are your thoughts on carb cycling and fat loss, meaning limiting carbs for three to four days, then having very high carb days in cycles? Um, there's not really any good data. So does it work? It's possible. Um, uh, you know, I, I also tell people not to count their macros because, again, it's, it's not, your body doesn't know what you're eating. It doesn't have carbohydrate sensors, for example, it has insulin, which is a hormone. So it's, a, but it's not just the carbohydrates. So there are populations in the world, like Okinawa, for example, in Katava, where they have studied this, and people eat very, very high carbohydrate intake. So I come, you know, my family's from Hong Kong and China. If you look at the 1980s, they're actually eating mostly white rice and vegetables. So if you look at the InterMAP study, they're eating like 350 grams of carbohydrates per day, almost all white rice. And there's almost no obesity and almost no, um, no type 2 diabetes. But the difference is that they're not eating all the time, there's no sugar intake, and so on. So, you know, I, I think that cycling it is, is possible as long as you're not still stimulating insulin. And, you know, uh, Dr. Davis talked about the difference between, say, carbohydrates, amylopectin A, which is found in grains, and beans, which have amylopectin C. It's completely different. The physiologic effect is completely different, but they're both still carbohydrates. So you, you really can't equate the two. That is, eating bread, I think, is relatively obesogenic, whereas eating beans is probably not. And there's a lot of studies on eating beans, and it seems to be fairly healthy. So just to say carbs, uh, it, it's very different eating bread, amylopectin A, and eating beans, amylopectin C. So, that's why I say well, it, it's, it's much more complicated than just carbs. Like it, it's a good start, but at the end of the day, it's not the whole answer. So if you're going to eat high, a lot of beans, then you're probably okay. If you're going to eat a lot of bread and sugar, then you're probably not going to be okay uh, doing that. But they're both still carbohydrates, so it is a bit more complicated than that. So sticking to, again, trying to make things simple, which is, again, going back to the 60s, it's like just eat real food, stay away from the sugar, stay away from snacking, don't eat all the time. Like these are the things like your grandmother would have told you. <laughs> uh, we've got a question here. Um, this question is kind of intended to connect Dr. Seafried's talk from yesterday with yours. Um, so in your clinic, um, obviously you're, I'm sure you're going to be seeing diabetic patients who are also battling cancer. So knowing that cancer cells have a seven to ten fold increase in the number of insulin find that you have diabetic patients who are also battling cancer that kind of get the, the, the double benefit of fasting? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, not a lot of data on that because uh, they just haven't been done. So we know there's clearly a link between obesity and cancer. So the WHO classifies, um, I think, 11 or something to cancers as obesity related, um, including breast and colorectal, two of the most common cancer. So we know uh, in the lab, for example, there's a lot of insulin receptors on breast cancer, for example. 
but does that mean lowering insulin through intermittent fasting, through low carbohydrate diets is going to work? I think it will, but is there any actual evidence? Um, not, not a whole lot. And the other thing is that uh, my suspicion is that if you try to take care of it after the cancer has developed, especially after it's metastasized, it's, it's probably not going to be enough. It is something that you want to use to prevent cancer um, more than you want to try and treat cancer with because I don't know that it's going to be strong enough to, to do anything by the time you get to uh, that stage. But there's clearly a link. I mean, the link between diet and cancer is just a fascinating one because, again, um, this whole focus of cancer medicine <laughs> in the last sort of 30, 40 years, cancer as a genetic disease, I mean, it's so wrong and so <laughs> stupid. Like, <laughs> honestly, I don't know how any intelligent person can look at the disease and look at the progress and think that mm -hmm. we're doing well. So you take a Japanese woman in Japan, you move that Japanese woman to San Francisco and her rate of breast cancer will triple. What in that tells you this is a genetic disease? Like nothing. It's not a genetic disease, right? It's stupid. But we do things like the Cancer Genome Atlas, which sucks out like so much research dollars, uh, looking at, oh, hey, we found this gene that's associated with breast cancer. And all these little old women are going out on their walks with their pink ribbons, you know, earnestly <laughs> earning money, and we're just pissing it away looking at the genetics of this thing, and it was not a genetic disease. So why don't we instead look at some of these therapies, looking at it from a new paradigm, from a sort of metabolic uh, mitochondrial disease state? And one of the things that I think, too, which is fascinating, is the fasting it actually improves mitochondrial health. So therefore, could that be a potentially useful uh, therapy to prevent the development of cancer, because as Tom says, if you have mitochondria, you, if you have healthy mitochondria, you don't get cancer. So that's a fascinating thing, but the, the, the amount of research that has gone into it is sort of minuscule because we've, you know, found every single gene, you know, uh, you know genetic mutation, and it turns out there's like a hundred of them and the patient next to her has 100 completely different genetic mutations. So how are you going to treat that? It's like, where has there been any useful therapy? So I think that the, the, it's, it's a fascinating question, um, but unfortunately I don't have those answers yet, and hopefully we can get some answers, but we'd have to really start changing the thinking of a lot of the cancer. Cancer is like, I mean, of all the areas of medicine, like that's the, the worst one, right? They make the least progress of anybody. <laughs> Uh, we have one last question. Jason, thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. Oh, thanks. I have a question. What's your suggested protocol for fasting in athletes? There's a certain anxiety, you know, that you shouldn't fast when you, you know, do CrossFit type of workout. So any comment on that? Yeah, so there is going to be a period of adaptation when you go from, you know, high carb to low carb, which is the keto flu and so on. Uh, fasting is, is sort of the same because if you're adapted to eating or if you're adapted to, to fat, metabolizing fat, whether your fat comes from um, the steak or whether your fat comes from your body fat, it makes a difference. So if you're on a sort of relatively low carbohydrate diet, then your body will get the energy it needs. So if you do muscle biopsies, for example, of people, you can see upregulation of the genes that are involved in um, uh, oxidation of fat. So your muscle gets more uh, adapted to fat burning. Basically, that's all it is. So during exercise, your muscles should get whatever energy it takes. I mean, if you think about the Inui, for example, who are eating all meat because there's no vegetables in the high Arctic, they're able to do whatever they need to hunt those seals and hunt those whales and so on. So your body will adapt to it. Uh, but there is, if you're trying to transition, you have to be aware of this sort of two to four week period where there's an adaptation. But after that, again, your body, like you don't have to, you, assuming that you have adequate fat stores, and so again, an average person has 25% fat. So if you're talking about elite athletes, even a marathoner is at about 10% body fat. So assuming you have that, then your body's gonna get whatever energy it needs from, from your, your stores of energy. So there's actually a big movement in elite athletics to do this so-called training in the fasted state. So 
It's a, it's a very, very interesting idea because what you do is you fast for 24 hours, uh, then you do your workout, then you eat. And sometimes they eat a lot. So we, we work with some professional athletes who are eating sort of five or 8,000 calories at a time, like a lot. So the, the, the point of it is that if you fast for the 24 hours, what you're going to do is you're going to increase, again, sympathetic tone, you're going to increase noradrenaline and growth hormone. So the increase in the um, noradrenaline means you can work out harder than you did before because you're the hungry wolf instead of the sort of sated lion. Then you eat and your growth hormone is high, so you're actually going to increase the, the, the production of um, proteins because when you exercise you're breaking down muscle protein. So therefore the bottom line is when you're talking about elite athletics, what you've got is the ability to train harder and recover faster. And when you're talking about those sort of millimeters or whatever, it's a huge advantage. So we actually have a lot of people talking about doing that to sort of uh, professional and Olympic athletes because again, they know that the difference between that multi-million dollar Nike contract and D-League sort of basketball is just a little bit. So this, this whole idea is actually coming around. Um, there's not a lot of data, but the physiology suggests that this, this sort of training in the fasted state is going to be a potentially useful uh, adjunct to treatment. Like that is, you know, in, when you treat people, like there's no absolute. So some people will love it and some people will hate it. Some people will respond well and some people won't. But what we always say is that it's a therapeutic option. So you can try it and if you do better on it, then great. If you don't do better on it, then just go back to what you used to do because these are, these, you know, you can change. But yeah, physiologically, there's nothing to, to block you from using fasting. And some people are doing it deliberately uh, to, to increase performance.